Thank you all for joining us on this fantastic Tuesday. We uh, we have a great guest coming up for you here in just a few short minutes. Ross is joining me on the Skype line. Ross, how are you? Hello. I'm still recovering from uh, Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, last week was fun. Uh, Greg Hemphill, yeah. uh, Robert Florence, uh, Kelvin Brawl at Kelvin Hall. It's going to be amazing. June 21st. Don't miss it. It's uh, wrestling at its finest. Now, uh, our guest today, Jim Tavare, uh, my God, uh, where do you start with this guy? He made the jump across the pond uh, back in, uh, well, before 08, but he was on uh, NBC's last comic standing, the only international uh, competitor to make it to the finals uh, in the history of the show. Uh, and he, he was absolutely amazing. I can remember watching his, uh, his uh, stand-up uh, on NBC, and it was just uh, hysterical. Uh, Let's see if we can get him uh, on the line here. It's dialing. I'm dialing. Look at me go. Jim. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. This is Nightmare, and Ross is joining us from Scotland. Ross, say hello. Hello, Jim. Welcome hey, to the show. Jim. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely fine with that. Now, how is uh, how's Vegas treating you? You've just caught me right in, uh, in the middle of my run at the Tropicana. Uh, and uh, it's going great, thanks. Yeah, uh, the room resembles uh, something from The Hangover in here, but uh, I tried to tidy up before you guys called me, but it's very early in the morning here. <laughs> well, especially uh, if you are on Vegas hours, which is uh, up all night, sleep all day. Yeah, they make you work pretty hard here. So, you know, I was doing promotional stuff in the day and going on everyone's radio and live show. It was a great show I did yesterday, a live thing in a theater with, Frankie Avalon was the headliner. So it's real wow. old school. Some bits of Vegas are so fantastic, you know, just like you imagine. You know, and, and, and you can walk into a bar here and you can recognize it from like two or three films. Like there's a few, the casino, the movie filmed a ton of scenes here uh, in tiny bars. It just look great. It's a great place, Vegas. The view I've got here now is looking out the window at that... Uh, Excalibur Hotel, which resembles something made out of Lego. And it's just like the whole thing just is just too ridiculous for words. And there's a thing, there's another thing you can see out the window, which is the uh, the roller coaster. You know, there's that roller coaster thing. And, and that kind of starts in a hotel and comes out. And I imagine people would get that confused with a monorail, <laughs> which you wouldn't want to do with a hangover. No, because that would be a really, really short, expensive trip to nowhere. Uh, there's a lot to do here, and there's no doubt about it. And, um, and there's I'm getting a lot of English people turning up to the shows as well, and it's, it's kind of nice to see those guys again, you know. Absolutely. Now, one yeah. of the uh, one of, I was reading about your uh, about your life history online, and uh, right. it, it doesn't uh, doesn't give me a lot of the uh, childhood background stuff. How did you get uh, into uh, wanting to be uh, an actor, comedian? Uh, musician were you from a, a musical family uh no not at all actually no but um uh, from about the age of 13 i i wanted to yeah do something musically so i uh, played a bit of guitar and uh just anything that was around uh so at school they made you play an instrument and the only thing left in the musical cupboard at school for me was the uh, tuba which is a great big heavy brass instrument that no one else wanted to play. And uh, so I, I chose that and carried that thing around on the bus. And, and it was a, a, a nightmare. But I think that led my, to my interest of very difficult instruments to carry around. So uh, I've, I've now made myself a rod for my back and I, I'm stuck with this double bass. I'm on my, I think about fifth or sixth bass now and i've just i've not been able to shake it off but um uh, you know so uh and I, then i learned double bass just just amateur just and then i got into a rockabilly band and uh, uh and uh, and then I, I moved to london when i was 19 to try and get something going with my band and then i just just london at the time just opened up a sea of possibilities of, of just doing everything like acting theater writing stuff and there was just so much going on yeah i'm talking sort of mid 80s now is that um, when you worked with the stranglers jim 
No, the Stranglers came much, much later on. I, I supported a, a band called the Mac Lads. I don't know if you are familiar with, with the name, the Mac Lads. And uh, I, I supported them. And I, I, funny enough, I had I'd saved up all my money for a, uh, an amplifier. And uh, I lent it to them uh, for one of their gigs. And they immediately broke it. And I think they felt quite bad. So they let me support them on a couple of gigs. And they were, it was very rowdy stuff. Uh, like, it was, I remember plastic beer mugs being introduced around that time. And they, it was very important for the Mac lads because they would get entire uh, glasses thrown at them all the time. It was just reduced to plastic cups being thrown, and so the impact was lessened when it hit you. I'm not sure what I can say on this show, but my introduction was extreme from them. But I don't know if I can quote it on here. Go ahead. But, oh, I'm allowed to, am I? Sure. Well, they used to introduce me as the lad with spunk dripping out of his ass. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, um, I don't know why that was. It was just the kind of thing. Anyway, they, 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 the audience chucked so much beer uh, at the stage that the amplifiers became saturated. And uh, so, they had to, so the band couldn't go on anymore because everything shut down. So I went out there just talking to them, kind of shouting at the crowd. And I didn't have anything of mic or at least I got more stage time than them ultimately at that gig. Why is it a double bass? Is, is, there, is there a single bass? Uh, no, I think it's simply referring to the number of octaves. It's um, it's it's two octaves lower than the. Oh, how do I explain this? Um, it just means it's two octaves lower than a than the normal, uh, say middle C. If you can understand. Oh yeah, so absolutely. If, if you play middle C on a piano, it just sounds two C's lower. If that's if that makes sense. So it's it's double the uh, bass frequency you know people especially in america they're probably not quite used to a guy getting up on stage with a big bass and uh it, it took some i had to keep doing it and doing it until the audience kind of get it you know that you know i i'm going to be i have this thing here it's a prop or whatever you want to see it as but i always have it and uh I, you know and it, it's just a it just it's like another person a big wooden wife that's how i think of it can you remember the first guy that you did with the double bass Good question, Ross. Uh, I think it was. I think I used to do something with the Jaws theme. Uh, I, I used to play. Uh, uh, oh, I know what I used to do. I used to go. Everybody's going surfing. <laughs> that, that, that was it. And then I, I do that after twenty minutes of not not playing the bass at all. And then I do that one joke, and then I'd say all the way here with a double bass. For one joke, and uh, and then I, I just used to carry it round for that, and then uh, then actually then I just kind of got better at it, and then slowly added more things as they occurred to me. Well, you know it's funny because I have VHS tapes. Of, mm -hmm. I was telling Nightmare this before you come on the air. I, we are roughly the same age, so I've pretty much followed your career since way back. Des O'Connor show and all the variety shows and chat shows and. Viva Cabaret and all the shows that you did. And we used to always tape um, some of these shows. And I've still got copies of you doing that routine with the Joyce. Well, so, so is my mother. You should get together with her. <laughs> I think I've, tried, I've, kept, I've kept my act current, I think, and, and, and relevant. But, uh, yeah, occasionally I'll, I dip into those old sound effects. Those, they just work. So I, I sort of reworked them in another way and to make it kind of feel fresh. But... Uh, yeah, I've got I've got a solid hour, but then I'll do stand up as well and just talk about anything I want. I've got a nice freedom going at the moment, so I feel you know I can drop back on the music. Like I performed for the Queen at, for two or three engagements, Her Majesty, of course, and um, uh, they didn't really go for the stand up, so I just played a lot more music. <laughs> that seemed to uh, they seemed to like that. Yeah. It's it's common knowledge that your Prince Charles is favourite comedian. Is that have you heard this? Well, I did a I did a couple of raw varieties way way back and uh, and met him. I think he had a soft spot for me because you know he was an amateur cello player, and um, and when he saw me, he, he probably thought I was playing a cello. Uh, <laughs> so I can only assume that's why uh, he likes me. And then um, he, in the lineup after he said, uh, "Where can I see you again?" And I, 
I remember telling him I was at Warwick University and I asked him if he wanted to go down on the guest list, but needless to say, he didn't turn up. Um, have, having said that, he did book me for a couple of events, like one of them was for the King of Greece, the King of Greece's 60th birthday, and he's like an exiled king. He was, I think, thrown out of Greece, but he stayed friendly with the royal family because, as you know, the, uh, the Queen's husband is actually uh, Greek by descent, and I think he was even born in Greece. So um, they got a connection. Anyway, so I did this thing for six, uh, 25 crowned heads of Europe. <laughs> And uh, so it, you've just got to think of it, however giant or scary the audience are, you've just got to think of them as just normal guys. And uh, But I found that they didn't really have the popular references that a normal audience would have. So, for example, they wouldn't really know what the Jaws theme was, I found. They don't go to movies or something. So I had to just kind of rethink on my feet. No. And the, the Queen was a great, great audience member, actually. She was just very... Uh, very supportive and I uh, had to go and meet her and stuff like that. It was a great, great day. And, um, and then I, I, I felt like I wanted to get like the royal crest put on the back of my upright base so I could spin it round and say, look, this is royal approval. Because you're allowed to do, you know, in England that you're allowed to have a royal charter. And uh, if, if, you're, if you've got the credentials, you can have the, the you know, the official stamp uh, of the of the of the royalty, you know, on your products, but I didn't quite get to that stage. Uh, I didn't get into the inner circle, as they say. So some comics do. I think Stephen Fry is very friendly with Prince Charles, and, uh, but he he's not his favourite comic because he doesn't really gig anymore. So uh, for a short time, and also Spike Milligan, a great British comic, died around that time I was doing all this work, and I think he was very a big fan of Spike. So I got that you know, favorite, favorite comic for a, a short period and does, I've used ever since. Does the, does the, uh, the Royal family uh, ever hand out uh, knighthood to the comic? <laughs> Do we, are we ever going to see a Sir Jim? Tabaret? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah uh, I think because uh, I'm, I'm more American now. I don't think I've qualified, but, um, uh, yeah, let's hope, let's hope so. Um, uh, it's, fu it's funny because I've been living in L.A. now, I think, for four years. And um, you're, when you live in L.A. and you move away from England anyway, from Britain, you always hear from people that you haven't seen in 20 years and people come and find you again. It's a strange thing. Um, basically, if you're doing a gig in, in the middle of L.A., your name goes up on the marquee and, uh, and, then, and everyone comes to, to L.A. for a holiday or to work or some meetings or something. And they, they see you, that you're in town and you're back again. So... Um, I got a call from Princess Diana's brother, uh, who, who, who I was in a movie with as an extra when we were like 19. Uh, he, he, um, we did this movie called Another Country with Rupert Everett and uh, Colin Firth. And I was um, Rupert Everett standing for all the shots for six weeks, it was. And all these kind of posh public school kids from Eton uh, were, were extras in this movie. And uh, he was one of them, and Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, was, was another. And uh, so we were all in this strange situation. Uh, and then I got, I got from that, I got invited to Prince Di's brother's birthday, and then Diana was always at the parties. It was just a surreal time, you know. But that was separate to working for Prince Charles. Uh, uh, completely different. Was this um, the 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 comedic stuff with the with all the the, the royalty shows you did for all uh, for the you know the the, the royal family? Uh, was yeah. that before or after you had your own variety sketch show on BBC? Oh uh, well, that that was um, I think about the same time. I got, you know got the royal variety shows. I got that booked, and then I got booked for my own show on a on a little known channel called channel five at the time so i was the first comic i think to have his own tv show on channel five and that was 1999 and um i mean i've done a lot of tv shows all those things that ross mentioned all those little shows i've done all that done all the the work you know appeared on everyone's show for five minutes that kind of thing and then um so uh yeah and I basically tried to get away from from the guy with the double bass and i tried to go into a new direction and do sort of sketch comedy, if you will. So 
I try to think of as many characters. I, I look to the Far Show. That's a show we have in Britain, a, a very successful show and very uh, innovative at the time. So I tried to create some characters myself and uh, see if I could do that. And I found I, I found I was, that was actually a strong side for me because I originally went to drama school. So I, I found I could really do that. I enjoyed doing that a lot. And we had to get some... Uh, I couldn't write enough stuff because we had 26 half hours to fill. So a guy walked into the uh, the writing meeting and said, look, I'd like to contribute. And his name was Stephen Merchant. He said, look, oh. I've, I've looked over your stuff here, Jim. He said, this isn't quite what I do, but I know someone that could write for this. And he gave us uh, a telephone number for, for Ricky Gervais. Uh, Ricky Gervais then came in, and he had a pile of scripts, like a foot deep, of ideas. Wow. Uh, he'd never done anything on TV before, so he was very keen. And we looked at this stuff, and it was just great. And, and I said, look, I can't learn all this, uh, Ricky. Do you want to be in this thing Cause, and do your stuff? Just do what you want to do in the show. And he did. And so he had a couple of regular characters, plus he'd write a load of stuff for us. And then uh, that was his first break. And then he, it was shortly after that he pitched The Office in a few different formats. And um, he came up with uh, the final thing that you know today, The Office. That's amazing. Wow. Now, I, so you give, you give Ricky Gervais his big break then? Well, he, that, and then he was on a show called The 11 O'Clock Show uh, as a regular yeah. kind of, uh, you know, like a sort of comedy reporter. And that was his, that was actually higher profile than my show. I mean, I, I was just on, you've got to remember, it's Channel 5 and low budget. Uh, so we were all learning, we were trying to find out what we could do. And he, he, he was learning on, on that show as well. Uh, and then he got booked for, the, for that 11 o'clock thing, and he was, he was okay after that, I think. One of the other things I have to know, how many tuxedos do you actually own? <laughs> well, I try, and, I, I try and buy those ones that are, are retro, you know, like 1920s with enormous braces, or what you call suspenders, which right. I find funny still. So I, I, I try and get that, that retro look, uh, and sometimes uh, I just, just wear them into the ground. But lately, I, I can't find any more, so I have them made in Hong Kong by a guy called Rocky, and uh, he just sends them over when I wear them out. I have to ask you about your uh, piano GTI. What kind of mileage does that get on the open road? <laughs> Um, I think you're talking about a, a, a sketch I did on a TV show some many years ago uh, uh, with, when I had a piano that uh, drove along the stage. So I'd sit at it and drive it, literally. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was for, for the Jack D show, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly what it was from. I saw that sketch, and I was laughing. My uh, older brother came over for coffee this morning, and we were doing my due diligence and watching uh, the YouTube clips and, and watching the sketch show and the uh, 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 Jim Tavari oh, show and cool. all, the, all the good stuff. And I saw that clip and I was like, oh, my God, that's brilliant. Uh, well, basically, that, was a t that came from a time when uh, the, the variety shows, uh, Jack D had a variety show, and it, it was a time when they just throw money at you. So if, if you said you wanted this or that prop, they'd go and get it and make it. You know, and it, and it would cost them whatever, I don't know, 20 grand or something. But that would never happen now. So, uh, you know, all uh, comedy now is, is much lower budget, and uh, that's just never going to happen. So I said, well, I'll, can I have a piano that I can drive? And they went, yeah, okay. And they just got a grand piano, and they gutted it. They put wheels on it. They put, like, all the lights on it so I could press buttons, and it would indicate left or right. Uh, it had uh, the music stand became uh, window wipers. And, uh, and then I pressed a button and it squirted water in my eyes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I didn't really have a joke for it. So I had to kind of, th when we got there, just, I just tried to think of, that's why some of those jokes, like you mentioned the piano GTI joke, I was just trying to think of as many kind of visual puns as possible before the payoff, which was driving off on this thing. It really was one stupid joke. <laughs> but, but they gave that prop to me and I had it in my house. And, uh, uh, I'm afraid to say my w wife got it in our divorce settlement simply because I couldn't get it out the house. <laughs> now, I got to ask you a question. We only have one sketch comic show in America, and it's the longest running Saturday Night Live. Uh, but the yeah. same complaint has been going on for 20 some odd years that they have no idea 
when to end the sketch. And I think that the UK sketch shows are so much more funny. And, and the sketches are so plentiful because you guys actually know when to end them. Uh, is there any way to fix America's sketch comedy show without, you know, assassinating Chuck Lorre? It's a very interesting thing of saying. Um, I think, yeah, what you're talking about is basically the punchline in comedy. And I think that, I think Americans regard that as kind of more old school. It's something that happened like in the 50s, maybe, uh, you know, with Jack Benny and, they they had they had a punch then, but I think since Monty Python, I do believe that that was an influence on the whole world. I think since that kind of looseness came along, that we've moved away from the punchline, and um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Uh, when we did the sketch show in the UK, we wanted to try and bring back that kind of big laugh on the last beat kind of thing, and because we wanted to get a broad audience and uh, we just wanted to do a classic thing that had solid punchlines and we worked really hard at it we tried all the material out in clubs uh, like night after night and honed it down and and when where the laughs came at the end then we we that 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 would work and then we'd film it but i don't think comedy's made like that anymore and uh, indeed we tried to sell that show to america and it was it was picked up by uh, fox and kelsey grammar produced the show but they've made exactly the same sketches, uh, you know, the urinal sketch. I think that went over okay. But everything else, they just copied word for word, and it made no sense to me that they didn't try and do an American version. They just replicated, and I think all the actors were very unhappy when they did it, the American actors. And uh, it, it was cancelled after four, I think. Uh, so that's my view on that. I, I, apparently in Hollywood, you can't upset the apple cart by saying, hey, you guys are doing it wrong. Even though people are still watching it in mass, uh, it well, is... I, I think I think comedy uh, is very subject to uh, you know producers and the fashion at the time, the trend of the style of comedy, which that's one of the things I hate about it actually. So what I'm saying is uh, that you know it, it, a lot of the producers are 25 years old and they have a you know they have their kind of college view of it, but I think it would be nice to get some someone in with a broader kind of view of things sometimes but that's just how it is you just got to go with that that's why the live thing they can't ever stop you doing your live show you know that for me it's great to have that because that will always be there when some of those producer guys are are doing other jobs <laughs> so uh, yeah I, I it's okay you know you just got to go along and you have you you've got to fit in with with the comedy at the time the comedy of the moment you know which is why jim davis and these kind of people look kind of dated now i think well, talking about your live show um i didn't know that in 2004 you supported michael bubbly how does that work i mean you're doing comedy he's doing music i i well no that was a standard format ross that was just me uh being the uh opener for a great you know like a sinatra style singer and it, so that that was great for me because i always my act is it kind of lends itself to that rat pack sort of feel. You know, I've got the suit, so I get booked for certain gigs that other people don't. And um, and he he did his show, and I I would do my half an hour before, and um, and that was that was you know just a standard kind of um, feature act for a big big name. Um, and I remember getting a I rented a camper van with my wife, and we just followed the tour around with this tiny camper van. And uh, we just went to gig to, to each venue, and we parked up the camper van in the at the venue we, each night. Stayed there and moved on. And it was it was great. I think we did twenty shows or something, uh, fifteen shows. Or, and then we did the Albert Hall, and my kids all came and saw saw their dad at the Albert Hall. And, uh, nice. And they they love Vegas actually, so they insist on going to <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> now, how old are your kids? Uh, one is uh, fifteen, and the others. Coming up to twelve, what are the, and they love Vegas? They really do. I can't tell you. It's very surprising to us because, well, you know, I think I had a one gig there, so we drove in for a one night with the kids, and they, we just stayed there. And they loved the streets. They couldn't believe that you know that everything looked like a giant Disneyland down the street, and um, and it was. I think it's for the boy. He he felt like he was growing up and. But it's a weird thing to grow up into a Vegas vibe, so I've got to try and steer him in the right direction. 
Uh, but uh, no, so we'll come back again and see all the shows, you know. The kids love coming to Vegas. They love yeah. watching Dad at the Albert Hall. They must have yep. been over the moon when you got Harry Potter. Uh, oh, that was yeah, that's fantastic. I always, if I get an acting job, I always think if uh, if, if 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 it will pass muster with the kids, and uh, so that one certainly did. Although I think uh, Louis, my boy, I think he was slightly too young to understand it, so I took him on set. And uh, they had, I had to leave with him because he was making too much noise when they're filming Dumbledore at one point. So I, I said, and now he realizes he, he should have behaved himself a bit more. But um, yeah, he, he's at an age where he totally gets the whole Harry Potter thing now and the sort of hugeness of it, if you like. It, it really is huge in, in, in the States as well, it's like magnified five times. And so when I do a show, I, I get asked to sign all the time as Tom the Innkeeper. So I'd, and I'd sometimes do a convention or two, and you know, it's it's just enormous being involved in that franchise, and uh, and, ha and wearing a hump on my back, of course, was uh, very exciting. Was was that like a backpack, or did they just build <laughs> that into the jacket? How did that work? Honestly, it was a, a prosthetic uh, kind of foam-like thing that that they measured your body to, and then they build up the hump. And I remember at the time saying to the director, I said, are you sure there's enough hump in here? He said, well, try a bit more. So I put like my, my a towel underneath it to make it ridiculously big. Because I suppose I've come from a theatrical perspective. <laughs> and uh, I've just put loads of towels in there underneath the prosthetics to kind of pump it out. And he said, yeah, keep that. And it looked the most ridiculous thing I thought. When you look at it back, you could just see a, 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 a shirt stuffed full of towels. But it was um, the director, Alfonso, he was a massive fan of that movie, you know, Frankenstein um, with... Um, Meets the Hunchback in Notre Dame. Yeah, Bride of Frankenstein with Marty Feldman. Well, are you talking about Young Frankenstein? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Young Frankenstein. and uh, One of the best movies ever. Great, isn't it? And so he was a big fan of that. And he just said, look, do it like that. And I said, are you sure about this? Yeah, just... And he, so I started stooping over and he said, no, get lower down and so your your hands nearly touch the floor so so i just did a full-on kind of pantomime character for that well you're i i love the facial expression when the minister of magic snaps at you and you drop your eyes to the floor like you've just uh, like a beaten dog that that made me <laughs> laugh oh my god it's like that was instantaneous oh well, I, I see this is a no fun zone i get it <laughs> it was fantastic. Well, and you it's have such an expressive good. face, anyways. I mean, you you are uh, amazing. Uh, oh, thank you, that, man. That was, that was a, such a, a good good thing to do that role, and um, yeah, it's, it's it paid a few bills as well. I'll be honest. When you're walking down the street in, in somewhere in America, do people recognise you most from Harry Potter, or is it Mister Six Flag? Oh, only only if I've got the towels stuffed in my jacket. Ross, they recognise me from Harry Potter. No, I never get recognised from uh, Harry Potter ever. Uh, but um, oh no, Mister Six Flags. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, basically, I I did a, a a tiny role in a commercial here and met Mister Six Flags, and I thought, my God, that guy, that guy looks really strange. And I thought, well, I could probably look like him in a sketch or something on on stage. So I looked him up and. Um, and then he, I found out he did this whole string of commercials um, advertising uh, Six Flags. So um, Six Flags, Magic Mountain. Um, so, uh, so I kind of did a thing in my show saying I looked like the guy. And then it kind of caught on a bit. And I got confused with the actual guy. And uh, all hell let loose. <laughs> uh, ironically, I did do a commercial with him, which was never shown, actually, but I did meet him from that, and I thought, what is this all about? And that's how that came about. I do an homage to, to uh, yeah, Mr. Six Flags, who's... When I do colleges, I do that one, because the kids all remember that from YouTube, that phenomena that was the Six Flags guy. But in yeah. Vegas, I, I don't really do that, because I think the older people wouldn't have a clue what that is. Yeah. Now, now when you were doing the uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, did right. you ever feel like just punching any of those kids right in the face <laughs> no because they were really well behaved a uh, nightmare they were very very sweet kids and they signed everything i gave them for the kids and uh, they couldn't have been you know nicer and 
they were kind of like mini royalty, if, if you like, and they're very well behaved. And then they get taken off the set and escorted back to their schoolroom where they had to spend a certain number of hours. And I think they respected me because they maybe seen the sketch show or something. Because I think I got picked up for that gig from the sketch show, and you know, even the kids used to watch that show. So that they, you know, they were all right with me. Well, I have trouble believing that that Malfoy bastard didn't need a good slapping now and again. Uh, yeah, no, I never, I, yeah, now he was a really nice guy, Malfoy, and, and an incredibly nice person. I've met with him a couple of times since on charity events, and he's, he's an extremely nice person. Uh, very business savvy guy as well. I think he, he has all kinds of other businesses he, he, he does. And, well, I guess uh, that would attest to his acting ability, because he definitely looked like he needed a slap on screen. <laughs> there you go you've got to have people you love to hate you see nightmare that's what i'm doing in this t in uh, la they like to you know especially with the british accent it, it kind of helps so i do villains here quite a bit now and uh and i'm, I'm happy to, to be that guy because it's it's a it's a kind of a new period for me in sort of acting out here and uh so yeah i, I usually play people that you love to hate before we get into what you're what, what you're working on right now, I want to let everybody know that just uh, Thursday the ninth, which would have been yeah. uh, just last week, yeah, uh, fifteen North won best feature at the SENE Film Festival. Uh, yeah, and you play Bert in that. Uh, it, it's a <laughs> it's a fantastic little movie. Uh, I, I haven't seen I haven't seen that movie. Um, I, I do quite a few that when I get asked to do a little picture. That that is an example of an independent movie, uh, you know, an innovative independent film made by uh, a group of filmmakers that have raised the budget themselves. And I do a, t a few gigs like that all the time. And um, this big thing I've got now coming out though is, is quite exciting. This is um, I did a, sh a TV pilot for. Uh, colonial reenactment show about the Revolutionary War called Courage, New Hampshire. That's going to play as a miniseries in, um, on May 27th. And then we're doing a season two this summer and a season three next summer. So that's been really good. And that, I'm like a, the main villain in it. Uh, it's kind of, you know, with wearing a wig from the Revolutionary War period and bullying colonials, basically. Uh, that was a, a load of fun. And so, yeah, there's gigs like that come up all the time in L.A. for me when I'm not doing comedy. Now, uh, are you, do you, uh, when you do your comedy, are you working the club circuit or are you getting booked in uh, big rooms and you don't have to go down and uh, uh, wait to hang out at uh, the Laugh Factory? Well, the thing is, the thing is, Nightmare, the, um, the comedy scene in L.A., as you know, is totally saturated because every comic in the world probably heads out to L.A. for some time in their career. So, but I was lucky. I fell in with uh, Jamie Masada, who runs the Laugh Factory, and he's one of the few LA comedy owners that actually employs comics properly and, and gives them a career. So I fell in with him, and he liked my stuff, and he'd seen me, I think, years ago on different shows out here. And uh, so he, he welcomed me into the club, and that's my resident club now. And, um, and he sends me all over. He's got lots of clubs all over the US. And, it's not a kind of lining up and hoping to go on affair. You get booked properly, and um, I, you know I've got a contract with them. So and they 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 kind of let me drop out when I've got a, another uh, TV gig or whatever. So and they're fine with that. So I only really work for the Laugh Factory in LA. It's obviously my favourite club, um, but um, on the road, you know, I'll, I'll headline comedy clubs on the road as well. But I'm I'm more interested in staying in in Los Angeles if I can. Uh, but it's tough. If you, it, my advice to stand-ups wanting to come out there, you know, you've got to just be there for as long as you can and get to know all the people. Because um, what what comics do with me, they want me to recommend them when they come over for a set. Uh, you know, the English comics, but it's it's hard for me to do that. You know, they want to know who you are. They want to see you working a ton of times before they book you, and uh, it's it's a real it's a real cattle market comedy in LA. Well, you know, as a, as a stand-up comedian, you get heckled. Mm. When does it stop being funny, Jim? When do the comebacks just <laughs> stop working? When, you know, but when does it just stop being funny and when do you, how do you handle that situation? 
Uh, I miss heckling, actually, Ross, because um, in the States, uh, there's almost none of it. And what I like about working here is that they're actually prepared to listen to what I've got to say. I found towards the latter end of my uh, comedy days in England, they were, uh, people would come uh, a lot more uh, lubricated. So they uh, were fairly drunk when they got there and, uh, and, and they always thought they were funnier than me. And that's not always the case if you're, if you're sober against a drunk guy, you know, it's a classic, and that, plus you've got the microphone. And yeah, you can dispatch them, get rid of them. I, I'm, I'm pretty harsh when, you know, the stuff I can do and I, hopefully stuff comes to your head. But I think if you've been doing comedy long enough, you, none of that's going to throw you at all. But it got to the point where huge groups of people would come to theatres and that, you know, on stag nights and office parties and, they thought the thing to do, they think they're making the show more interesting by shouting stuff. And I don't get that at all in, in the US. Uh, they're more respectful. Um, that's not to say I don't like English audiences, it's just that there was a problem, a kind of thing that was coming out from the, I don't know if it's binge drinking, I don't know what it is, that, you know, in society that made this kind of very vicious kind of uh, bear pit sort of, feeling uh, I don't I used to I you know in England I I was booed when I started down in southeast London I was booed off, booed off and booed back on and ha you have stuff chucked at you and they were great days but when you get established I don't really want to have to deal with that anymore you know um I can do and all every comic can but you know what why should we so yeah that's my, that's my opinion of that you know honestly a nightmare if you've been out the UK, it's a real different culture, the comedy audience thing. It, they almost want to be more, they want to be a part, part of it, and I think that's how they feel they're getting involved, is by heckling. Whereas yeah. uh, being a part of it here is just them coming to enjoy, they, you know, they invest their trust in you here, and they want to know that you're good, and you've been doing it, and you can deliver, and that's good enough for them, and, and you have a great show from it, and you can talk to them, and, and you can they're still a part of it, but they don't feel the necessity to kind of end a comic's career on the stage. <laughs> yeah. I've got, yeah, you know. One of the biggest problems these days I have found, I do a little cabaret act. I, I used to be a magician when I was 14 right. years old, and I'm, I'm, I still do a cabaret act. I'm now a singer at the weekends. But one of the biggest problems nowadays with audiences and yeah. my my sort of uh, genre as people on body mobile phones the whole time, just sitting on their phones and during gigs, you know, it doesn't say a lot about my act, but it's not just me that gets it. It's happening everywhere, isn't it? Well, you, you want to try doing a gig for a phone company like I did. I once did a corporate gig and it was literally for a phone company and they just thought it was fine to just have their phones ringing all the time. That was one of the worst gigs I've ever done. Uh, I, I agree with you, Ross. You know, it's. Um, I think a respectful crowd though would turn their phone off. And it's all down yeah. to how the gig is run, and if they want it to work successfully, they will tell people to switch off their phones and whatever they've got in their pocket. Now, now was that corporate gig in Seattle? No, no, that corporate gig was in uh, the UK. Actually, that was in, I think, Edinburgh or something. It was a, I can't remember which mobile phone company it was. Uh, no, I tell you who it was. It was for. It wasn't a, it was car phone warehouse. It was for them. Uh, and they just thought it was all fine. We, this is what we do. This is our job. We call each other up during the show. The phone's ringing all the time. Terrible nightmare. Yeah. I, well, I, I was expecting it to be T Mobile. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, the ghetto phone service. So, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got them. Yeah. But uh, I don't do it. No, I don't do any corporate work in the States. To, uh, that, I don't do that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I found that the English credit tough at the end there. Um, you know, I found it was just out of control. Um, sometimes I used to do a gig like in Nottingham or something, and I'd leave the show at, like at midnight, and I'd have to get my bass to the car, and I'd get all kinds of grief from people that took it to be uh, amusing to themselves to like pick on the guy with a. It was literally like being bullied in the school playground, trying to. And I found I having to like run to my car with this bass, and like gangs of kids were 
found that amusing. I don't know. Is that any way to to live? I, I don't. I don't think it is. Uh, I, I I can't be bothered with that. Do you have a highlight of your career of all the things you've done for you? What's been the best part of it for you? Well, I think Ross. I think you, I think the moment is the most important thing. You are as good as your uh, last joke or whatever, or your next joke. Everything that's happening now. If you can still keep doing it, then it, the, the enjoyment is. is perversely greater in the moment right now. So if, if you're still doing what you like doing, I think that you've sort of got something right. So it's always a buzz to me to be looking down and thinking, well, I'm still doing this. And, uh, and that's, that's a, that is a buzz for me. That's how I think of it. But uh, yeah, all along the way, there have been some amazing gigs. But I look at these as just a gig. You know, if it's the queen there, like I say, I'll look at her just like any other guy. Uh, and she d she doesn't heckle, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but it was weird doing the gig for her that, that the audience thought, oh, my God, who is this? What is this guy doing you know, with, with the bass? What, what is this? We don't get this. And then she started chuckling. And by default, everyone copied her chuckling. You know what I mean? And they copy, and she was the one that set it all off. And uh, she was a great audience member. See, I think uh, I would. I think I would be the worst audience member if I had to take my cues from the Queen, because <laughs> I, I I would sit back there and be laughing anyways, and people would be like, "Shh, it's not funny until the Queen thinks it's funny." That's exactly what it was, and the, they said to me that the producer said, "Look, the Queen has seen every comic there is. She will not find this funny, but she's respectful." And I I, I bore that in mind, but she was sat right at the front, and she did laugh, and she did get it, and I I, I was thrilled and. You know, I, I took my made my own judgment that she was actually a very good audience member. It was a barbecue, you know, uh, right. <laughs> was out, and it was like in a marquee tent kind of thing. It was completely relaxed, like you're just playing at someone's party or something. Yeah. I I can't see the queen at a barbecue, but then she again, was, American yeah. barbecues I think are probably a little different than uh, the British barbecues. Well, the only thing about this barbecue, the uh, the 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 guy that did the barbecue was Anton Moziman, who was a, he's a huge chef. I don't know what's happened to him recently, but he was a giant chef in the nineties, uh, and so he was the actual guy like tossing the burgers, you know. But it was more than burgers; it would be I don't know um, swan or something. <laughs> I I, is it, it, now is that true? When you go to the when you go to uh, Buckingham Palace, they they feed you weird food like that. Oh yes, yes. You have to be initiated into the uh, um, the British Game and Wildlife uh, dinner service, and uh, so you may you may eat um, red squirrel. It's very popular and very rare, of course. It has to be the rarest kind of food that you can find. Do you have uh, something in the works after you get done uh, with uh, the Tropicana on the nineteenth? I'm actually going back to England actually uh, next week, and then I'm off to the Middle East for some shows. Yeah, I'll come back, and then um, I just did a, I just signed up with a, a record label, weirdly enough, and I did a couple of uh, music videos, starring in music videos for a couple of uh, bands. One of them, a British R&B singer called Joel Compass, uh, and it won loads of awards. Um, the, the music video, uh, the song is called Back to Me, and they used a technique called Cinemagraph, uh, which is basically filming something totally still, but only one thing in the frame moves. So it might be a face of someone, and then someone's a, a paper bag is blowing behind them or something. Anyway, so this was like a sort of uh, cutting-edge technology. And it's won loads of awards, and I got booked to do all these uh, music videos. So I've got to do a load more work on that when I get back to L.A. and finish off some filming. I just did one for a big group in uh, New Zealand called Phoenix Foundation. So basically, L.A. make all the music videos for the world. And uh, and we've got to put some, I've got to do another day or two on that. Um, so, yeah, there's always little filmy things I have to do all the time out there. Now, do you have a, a favorite genre in your film work? Because you've done everything from, you know, comedy to horror to drama. Uh, yep. Obviously, classically trained at the uh, Royal Society of Dramatic Arts. Um <laughs> Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. Royal yeah. Academy, sorry. Yeah, um, I did that way back. I did acting, and I'm just doing it again now. And 
I just I took 20 years off from acting because um, I didn't really like the scene much at the, when I first got into it. So I dropped away from it and then did stand up and became uh, interested in that. And now coming back here, I find that uh, almost uh, you get, uh, you know, if you walk into a room with the right look or something, then you can get booked for stuff here. So I did California Occasion, which was a TV show here. And I got booked to just some small roles on, on shows like that. And now I get known as sometimes a villain, sometimes a British guy. I can use both. Um, he's never got any hair, but, uh, you know, I can always wig up. Uh, and basically, if you're an actor in L.A., in versatile, flexible, you can get a lot of stuff. And it, it just it's fascinating to me how the whole thing works. So, you know, I think I'll do a lot more here, I think, for the time being. Um, but obviously, we're Britain, we're now making the Star Trek. We've got we've got that gig. Star Trek's going to be made uh, in Pinewood, and so uh, hopefully they've got some uh, aliens for me to do with giant heads. <laughs> That's not typecasting, is it? Oh no, no. <laughs> I'm just so delighted, Jim. I'm so delighted that your career is going so well, and that it's okay, mate. Yeah, thanks. It's going okay. You've got to keep reinventing yourself, mate. I think in this game, you've got to keep uh, ahead. You've got to keep think. You know surprising people. I think if you get stuck in one thing, then you get perceived as someone who just does one thing. And I think you have to keep pushing it if you can. And there are ways to do that, you know. Jim, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thanks, Jim. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.